Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to finish up today with a special selection, which is where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to check out. If you have your own song you'd like to submit for special selection, you can find a link to do so in the description below. Today's selection comes out as from Brendan. It says, hey Brian, here's a radiation-themed tech death band from Germany named Cytotoxin that I greatly enjoy. In this song called Redefining Zenith, they feature Sven from Aborted on guest vocals. Enjoy! So that's what we're going to be checking out today. We got this group, Cytotoxin. We got a, a featured vocalist. Let's dive into it and see what they're bringing to the table. We got the the clicking in the backgrounds. Just that super consistent drum play. little modulation there. Oh, nice little bass run. I mean, the guitar work is sick, but the bass work is just very delightful. Rhythmic synergy right there. Such a tight staccato run. Half time in it. really interesting finding these pockets of groove but kind of swinging out of them. You can just hear that rattling around. That's such a low tone. There's a lot of layering going on in that vocal stuff though. Those quick hits over to the China I think that was.
here we got another one of these pockets of groove just playing into it real hard. Oh, I love that. Interesting, there's two vocals there, but we only have the one vocalist. That is some clean bass playing. Yeah, see, here's that, that uh, background clicking again. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, just I want to point out something real quick about that intro and outro, having that clicking. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have noticed what it was, or at least kind of think of what it was, without having that introduction to this group. But uh, being that they're radioactive-based, uh, you know, it does sound like uh, one of those little devices that um, clicks depending on, or makes a clicking sound depending on how close or far you are from a radiation source I don't know what the device is called uh, but I'm pretty sure they have increasing intensity of clicking or chirping or whatever you want to call that crackling sound uh, yeah really interesting to put that at the beginning and the end uh, being that they are, I don't know what a radiation based band is <laughs> maybe we'll figure out when we get into the lyrics uh, but like, what is radioactive death metal? I mean, maybe I'm reading into that wrong. Maybe that's their genre. <laughs> maybe I'm just completely coming at that from the wrong angle. But, yeah, real interesting stuff uh, with that intro and outro. Um, I Also, the intro had this cool little thing where we had a guitar idea that started before the song started. And we got, like, a little introduction to the riff and then just kind of faded out and then we brought the song in proper that was uh well that was interesting i thought it worked well with the intro and i thought we were going to get this extended uh like extended bleed into the song proper but it didn't happen we just had this singular moment of like seeing the song before it happens and then we got right into it so it wasn't drawn out as much as i thought it was going to be All right, with the intro and outro out of the way, you know, let's talk about what's going on here. There is a lot of technical stuff going on here. I, I don't know if this is tech death or not. I definitely get the death aspect, but I also see a technical part to it as well. There's a lot of movement on these guitars, whether it's the strumming or the fretting. And that goes for the bassist as well. The bassist is pulling off some sick lines in this. Absolutely love it. Um, and I'm really glad that they had the, uh, the the dedication to the bass work, not just to put this type of music in the song, but to also showcase it in the video. I absolutely love seeing bassist shred as well. It's something that just I don't feel like we get enough visual indication of. Um, but yeah, just really enjoyed that here. I also noticed that this came out in... 2017 but everybody's recording in a different area <laughs> and for uh too much of this video i honestly thought that it was a post covid uh music video where they just recorded everybody recording their stuff well they they recorded footage of everybody recording their musical parts uh in isolation you know in their own homes but no this was years before that so is this group just spread out across the globe maybe across their country uh i don't know it's interesting though i don't remember seeing much like this prior to 2019 2020 but now it's just like yeah that's normal i see videos like this all the time it really didn't even dawn on me how odd this was that it came out in 2017 all right to the song proper though lots of technical work everywhere um we have a lot of this is rhythmic though 
And I don't want to say that it's lacking in the melodic compartment. There is a lot of musical ideas being presented here in both the guitar and the bass. Not so much in the drums and the vocals, they are purely textual or rhythmic uh, aspects of the song, but the guitar and the bass are carrying a lot of melodic movement to them. But the song doesn't really emphasize them. Or that is to say that my ear doesn't hear emphasis within the song on the melody. A lot of it is on the technical aspect. Uh, I don't know if that is a production thing. Maybe that's their guitar tones. I don't know. I just It was really difficult for me to hear the melodic movement. I saw their hands going and I kind of got the idea of notes moving. But really a lot of it was just the fuzz and the texture of the notes that were being driven at me. Uh, which is kind of a shame. It's um, because musically, visually, it reminds me of something like Archspire, but Archspire very clearly represents the melodic components in their mix themselves, whereas this one seems to hide them and really emphasize more of the texture of that the guitar and the bass are bringing to the equation, not so much the notes themselves which is just a really weird thing. Maybe I just don't have an ear for this and I need something that's just hyper clear production. This might be just a little too uh, gritty, too, too metal-y of a production for me. Uh, maybe once I get more into, into death metal, this will just become normal for my ears. But yeah, it's, it was just really difficult for me to hear the notes that were underneath a lot of these textures outside of the massive jumps right when we get those those pitch harmonic squeals in the middle of an idea occasionally yeah i certainly heard the jump there but we also shifted uh, a couple octaves higher which jumps into different eq bands and maybe they were just more present in the mix than some of the lower stuff that they were working with a uh, majority of the rest of the time majority of the rest wow you are a wordsmith brian um but yeah, so I really enjoyed that this was a playthrough video because I think if I had just listened to this audio only, I don't think I would have appreciated the melodic aspect as much. Um, but I do wish I could have heard it more. Maybe, like I said, just getting used to it. But maybe it is also a very purposeful mix thing. Uh, speaking of that, though, the song does seem to represent a lot of rhythmic components and there are several very cool rhythmic elements in here. The majority of the song, if not all of it, I can't say I was paying attention to the meter all of the time, but it felt like 4-4 every time I checked in with it. And there weren't any sections that came in that felt different to me where I would have instinctively said, okay, what time signature are we in? Everything was uh, kind of flew under my, my meter radar, if you will. Um, so I never really had much of a, a reason to check in and say, you know, what's happening here in the time signature? Uh, but within that, though, they really push the boundaries of what they can do with 4-4, not with phrasing. Like I said, nothing really feels odd or out of place, but they do play around a lot with variation of rhythmic structure. Uh, there's a, a lot of these sections are based entirely around 8th and 16th notes. However, we do not hear the same rhythmic combinations of these 8th and 16th notes throughout the entire song. In fact, we hear a wide variety of rhythmic combinations, not just on a single bar, but throughout a single phrase even. And it's really impressive to have that in just a single song. I'm going to assume that their album is... Uh, composed in a similar vein and possibly even multiple of their albums are composed in a similar vein uh, at least this was their third album and it just kind of it's a little bonkers to think that they continuously write songs which such with such rhythmic variety to them and continue to find new variations on these rhythmic structures but that's a lot of extrapolation. I've, I've based that off of a single song. It could be that this is their outlier track and that everything else is more melodic based rather than rhythmic. I don't know. But yeah, there's so many rhythmic things going on in here. Um, and it's the cool thing, though, is that we never really lose the groove. We might slip out of the pocket a little bit and find something a bit more rigid that loses the groove just a hair. But... 
we always tend to slip right back into that grooviness, you know, a beat, two beats later. It's more of a, a contrast, basically, instead of, you know, really getting into something that loses grooviness for an extended period of time. Um, but what's also, what's also interesting is within these rhythmic structures that are fluctuating throughout the song, we do find these really neat moments where every instrument comes together and just really nails home something that's not necessarily complex on its own, but complex when you think about it in the scape of the entire track of every instrument doing this. Um, there are these really quick 16th note hits. Uh, real short staccato stuff like like back to back it was these these pockets of like four or five strikes back to back and uh you know the bassist is in on it the guitarist is in on it the drummer is in on it and the thing is is that these are super short notes and they're super quick notes so if anybody is a hair late or well, either a hair late hitting the note or a hair late releasing the note, it's going to sound muddy. You're going to lose that gap that, between them. And that's not a very big gap to begin with. These are very quick notes. So everybody has to have this raw mechanical precision about it. Uh, and not just the precision to do it once, but the consistency to do it several times in a gap, but also playing that phrase multiple times throughout the song. Um, and for everybody to just be in on it every time. I mean, here I'm going to assume that there's a little bit of help from the producer cutting off some of the uh, some of the the release on some of the notes. Maybe somebody plays a note just a hair too long, just you know, cut it off a bit early or whatever. But I really believe that these guys could do it live with no uh, no edits, uh, just because they're they're just so technically inclined, right? The studio version is going to be raw perfection no human is perfect but i think still like 98 percent of the time they're going to nail this live and it's just bonkers to think about that sort of synergy between people just how in sync you need to be with your two fellow bandmates while performing this and how locked into the time you have to be because like i said even just a hair of a second late on releasing or I guess in this case it would be uh, a muting, not a release of the note, but a muting of the note or a hair late on attacking the note. And it's going to muddy that section up. It might even not just muddy the one hit, but everything that comes after it in that five notes, in that one pocket. Uh, and because they all come together with this and they have that space between each of the notes and it's just perfect. It is so punchy. It is so good. Um... It's just a combination of the performance and the production coming together to create this rhythmic structure that that pierces right through all of the sound that we heard before it, right? We have a, we have a lot of these long runs, um, and the notes just kind of flow into each other, very legato style, and then we punctuate these ideas, this huge legato line into this staccato section of just super sharp notes moving back into a legato melody. Um, and it's just this really nice contrast. So not only do we have the already impressive rigidity in this section uh, because of the spacing between it, but we have a contrast of the legato section prior and after that really allows the punchiness of the section due to those short notes, really allows it to flourish. Absolutely love those moments. And it's just, you know... <laughs> They brought it back like three or four times. It's not like it was an isolated thing. And every time it never got old. I was like, yes, love it. Love, love it, love it, love it. And it's because of the contrast. Um, so yeah, just rhythmically, everything about this song is, uh, it's phenomenal. Um, I do have a question about the drums though. Occasionally, on those really fast double bass kicks... I would see his feet or legs moving at a rate that matched it, but other times it looked at halftime. How does that work? Maybe it was a, a, video, a visual thing. Maybe the video just couldn't keep up with it. But at least to my eyes and ears, it felt like he was hitting the pedals half as many times as bass kicks were coming out. And I don't know how that works. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's some sort of drum technique that's kind of like blast beats where you can just get extra hits out of 
a, a single stroke. You know, actually, blast beats are the next thing I was going to talk about, so I might as well just go into that. Uh, blast, well, actually, gravity blasts here, weren't they? Uh, which are pretty cool. You just kind of rest the drums. I just learned about this the other month, which is why I'm like super stoked to talk about it. Uh, you rest the drumstick on the middle, well, the middle of the drumstick on the, the rim of the snare, and you sort of just kind of get this rotating motion to it, but you also combine it with moving your arm up and down, and basically you get this, this fulcrum, this point of pivotness. Uh, so gravity allows you, you get the downstroke that you do, but gravity with the way that it pivots on this uh, this point will also give you a second hit. I think when you're coming up, if I remember the video right, I, I went and, and watched a demonstration of it. Um, but basically you get two strikes for every downstroke, which is just wild. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe there's something going on with the drum kicks that they can do that with too. Uh, obviously, you know, there were two pedals, two feet, but still, it looked like each of the kicks was getting two hits out of it. Um, and again, it could have just been the video, I don't know. But if you have any information into that, whether it's a technique or just uh, a, something that was in the video, you know, just let me know, because I'm a bit confused by it. It happened like two or three times. Uh, there were some times when it lined up and sometimes when it didn't. I was just... Uh, a little confused about that, but I'm not a drummer, so these are kind of you know these are things I don't know, and you guys have an opportunity to educate me on. Uh, I think the last thing I want to talk about before we move into the lyrics is uh, the vocal work. A lot of it just seems to be like false chord growls, uh, very impressive in their own right, especially with the different styles and techniques. I noticed a lot of mouth shapes. Uh, but there was one part in particular that sounded, uh, like it was just pure fry. It was just, just the raw crackling, right? But the thing is, so I don't know the science behind this, but you can speed up or slow down how often you get those pops in your fry. And he had this super slow rhythmic crackling to it. And he must have just, like I said, I don't know what is happening. <laughs> You're going to have to go find a, a vocal channel to uh, to get some more technical information about it. But um, yeah, just really slowing. It was almost like less air pressure maybe. Or maybe a consistent air pressure, just less something. I don't know, man. It was just really slow. But the cool thing was, by itself, I don't think it would be very interesting. It might even just kind of be annoying. But they double and triple tracked it with different pitches and different rhythmic bounces of that crackling, that fry popping. And it created this really neat sort of rhythmic counterpoint going on in all of these different vocal layers. Uh, and then he was like opening and closing his mouth and getting these ooh-ah, ooh-ah kind of sounds, which kind of changes the pitch of these as well. And it was just a really neat sort of metal scatting <laughs> multi-layered metal scatting just i don't know how else to describe it it uh it was neat i don't know if i would want to listen to it often but it was neat to hear once i, I really like just that sort of uh, vocal experimentation and really pushing what metal sounds are you know I can't say I've heard anything like it before, and that right there is a plus in my books, even if I can't say I greatly enjoyed it entirely. I enjoyed the experimentation of it. Um, and uh, speaking about the vocals, uh, Sven killed me, though. <laughs> the dude is over here with these massive, uh, you know, just big growling vocal lines. Just like he's the most bored dude in the world. He, like he he signed up for work. He showed up. He clocked in. He ain't happy to be here, but he's laying down the vocal lines. He's doing a killer job of it, but just the body language is not matching, you know, not matching the work. And as somebody who is very visually animated when I talk, I don't know if you guys have caught on to that yet. I use my hands a lot to demonstrate things. My my body matches the intensity in my voice, I hope, at least. Uh, it's very different to see somebody who has all of this power and strength in their vocals and just kind of be doing this in front of the microphone. 
<laughs> the whole time killed me. Uh, just, uh, you know, not taking jabs at the dude. It was just a really funny disconnect between the visuals and the audio. Um, cracked me up. So yeah, we're going to dive into some lyrics here, see what's going on. Uh, hopefully there's something radioactive in the lyrics, because otherwise this just sounded like death metal to me in every way. The most glorious Soviet Union power plant stood in the middle of paradise, Radiation Eden. Alright, I'm pretty sure I already know where this is going. Uh, so we already have the words Eden, we have Zenith from the title, we're definitely looking at uh, paradises, right? Oh, we would have the word paradise in the second line. Uh, and all of this is in reference to a glorious Soviet Union power plant. Alright, war with Mother Russia calls for victims, draws all blood out of the veins, mismanagement and state bankruptcy, the reactor lost in the agenda. Thousands of working hands, eternally bound to an atom, ruined nations constructing a steel dome under live wasting conditions. Roof so high to cover churches, working hours minimized by radiation load, a masterpiece engineers built with pride, tons of steel, a prime construction site. So this is a very, uh, almost a clinical description of this power plant and the surrounding situation of it. We're looking at it from the uh, political side of it, uh, with uh, the state's agenda, uh, looking at the management side of it, looking at it from the workers' angle, and also just looking at it from sort of a admiration of the raw engineering that went into it like it's very multifaceted but it's also a very dry uh, factual angle to explore this it's also very surface level i don't think there's a bit of metaphor in here at all other than paradise and eden being presented everything else is very one-dimensional very uh surface read 1986, the reactor disaster, pelt the block with lead and sand, cubic meters of nuclear waste, vor material melted together in unknown mixtures, a deadly combination spread it over several floors, suggestions become laws, decisions made behind closed doors, a dead machine which cannot be exchanged, a nuclear grave, tons of radioactive dust, a human legacy beneath the construction, final storage of soul. The storage of soul, experiment failure, who fails will die soon, no half-life of mind. Nice little uh, play on words there, bringing in the idea of half-life based in uh, radioactive decay into uh, the, the idea of the workers being contaminated uh, with this as the power plant is undergoes a... A breaking down of things and we can see this even from the beginning when we hear that there's a mismanagement um, and state bankruptcy uh, and I think this is referring to Chernobyl it mentioned 1986 uh, which I think was the year of the Chernobyl Chernobyl incident um, so we have marode construction will fall down, no answer to the question of time, resisting shelter over an accident which will never be over, new safe confinement buying time instead of a solution, uranium and plutonium are more resistant than any construction, half-life of these substances is several thousand years, the green meadow in Chernobyl remains a vision. Yeah, so this is about uh, the Chernobyl power plant. And like I said, it's very, very surface level read. It's very matter of factly, very, uh, st um, not statistically, but uh, factually described. There is a little bit of metaphor here and there, but, you know, even going back to the idea of paradise and Eden, I think that is more about the vision of the power plant prior to its, uh, the, the destruction of it the uh, the incident that happened um sort of what how people viewed it right post incident we definitely have a very different uh collective vision of it the word chernobyl especially when we think about the power plant there uh brings about different 
images to mind or words to mind than it probably did while it was being built or when it was uh, still operational. But yeah, I mean, it, it talks about some of the things that led up to it, uh, what happened during the event, and what it looks like now, what the area looks like now, and sort of the repercussions of it. Um, interesting. It comes off of the album Gamma Geddon. So we definitely have a radioactive angle there. They have a song called Trinopolis. Interesting. So it's not, maybe it's not even just this song. Maybe they literally do sing about nuclear or radioactive elements um, in all of their music. That is an interesting theme to chase after. Uh, you know, as usual, though, trying to tie the lyrical themes back to the musical themes. I, <laughs> I don't really see any correlation here. We have death metal underneath the lyrics, and the lyrics could just be a very uh, Cliff Notes version of the Chernobyl incident. I don't think there's any anything here that kind of exaggerates anything or utilizes metaphor to explain everything. Like I said, it's very dry understanding of <laughs> the entire situation from uh, pre, during, and post. So, yeah, it's just, it's words over music. I don't really see anything that, that really goes together in either of them. Which is fine, 100%. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, okay, this is where you guys come in. <laughs> I don't know where else to take this analysis. I think I looked at a lot of the stuff I heard, but I also have a lot of questions coming out of this. Is this really a band that focuses on radioactive elements or events or anything radioactive, I suppose, in their lyrics? And really, how, how much mileage do they get out of that? It doesn't seem like something that they could uh, spend a lot of time doing, but Assuming that this is the third album that is exclusively about radioactive topics, that's kind of impressive. Um, so yeah, hit me up if you have any extra information about cytotoxin as a whole, but also if you have anything that you want to add on to my analysis or even, you know, the lyrics themselves. I didn't really go into them because they seem like a surface read to me, but it's possible I missed something. Above the description box is a... Above the comment section is a description box, and in there is a link for Linktree, which will take you to this menu right here. It has everything related to the channel in it. You can pick up some merch. You can follow me on Twitter, join the Patreon, all sorts of things. Go ahead and check it out. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I'd greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps it up for today. We'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC as usual. We will continue on with our wild time signatures week, and we'll look at another special selection. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.